And just like that, two days after the heat wave, I've got a fire going again. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good middle of the night. Whatever time of day it is when you're watching this. Hi. Uh, so today I just kind of wanted to talk about things that make my off-grid RV life a little simpler, easier. Yeah, so totally all things that are just my opinion. You might have a different opinion and that's totally fine. Um, but we all know that this life, you know, even though we call it a simple life or the simple way of living, it isn't always. It's not easy. <laughs> But, you know, those who do it usually love it, otherwise you wouldn't be doing it, unless you had to, unless you were forced to into it, I guess. Either way, today I'm going to talk about things that have made living this lifestyle easier for me. Let's get started. Numero uno on this list, and this list is not in any particular order, but I have to give it to the roof. This floating roof above the camper has made a tremendous difference. At a certain time of day, it provides um, shade on the camper. Believe it or not, it actually does keep it a few degrees cooler at least. Um, it might have something to do with the fact that the sun is just not sitting directly on the camper roof. But there is a bit of an airspace under there. That maybe helps too, but some of you might not know this is a floating roof. I know a few people seem to think that, you know, the roof is just sitting directly on the camper. It's not. You can see the posts here. So there's no weight on the camper itself at all. It's just floating. But yeah, big time game changer. I no longer have to worry about leaks in the camper. And it has extended the life of the camper by a number of years. It's also great in the winter time because there's no worry about snow sitting on top of the roof. You know, wet, heavy snow just sitting there with all its weight is never a good thing. I know most people get up and shovel it off. But with this roof, there's no worry of that. It's just literally any snow that lands up there will eventually work its way down. Most people will tell you that they like the sound of the rain on their camper roof. Um, I didn't, not from the very start. Because for me, having rain land on the camper roof just worried me about leaks. I literally couldn't sleep at night, especially during a real heavy downpour. Um, I just couldn't sleep. All I kept thinking about was, where is my camper going to leak? I definitely no longer have to worry about that with the, um, with the roof built over top. Which is good for me because, you know, I no longer lose sleep. <laughs> Although I have a tin roof on there as well, um, it doesn't make that tin roof, loud tin roof sound because there's actually boards. Like the entire roof is boarded in underneath of the tin. So I don't have that loud rain sound. Um, for me that's a good thing because I like to sleep and that kind of sound actually keeps me awake. It's not the same for everybody. Some people really enjoy rain on a tin roof. Um, if it's raining hard enough, you know, I still hear it of course because the camper roof is still thin. So. Okay, let's move on to number two on the list, and for me, number two on the list is solar. Now, when I'm talking about solar, I'm including everything, like the whole solar system. Your solar panel or panels, your battery or batteries, your charge controller, inverter if you have one, the whole shebang. Living off-grid, you know, Solar power isn't necessary for absolutely everyone. It really depends on your needs. However, it does make things easier and it does make things more convenient. If you want to, you could run a generator all the time or whenever you need power. Or you could just have a solar panel, charge up your batteries when it's sunny for free, and give you power inside. And don't get me wrong, I do have a generator as well, but it's more or less just a backup. I run that thing for three things, and I maybe run it for 15 minutes every day, maybe. Literally, I just use it for microwaving, if I need to microwave something really quickly, or blowing my hair dry with a hair dryer, or using a hair straightener. That's pretty much it. But to be honest with you, I don't really need the generator a whole lot because I do have an inverter, a 3000 watt inverter. I still just don't have it hooked up yet, unfortunately. The thing about solar is that there is a bit of a startup cost. Obviously, you know, 
the panels, they can be costly. They're pretty good now though, like pretty much a dollar a watt or if you're lucky you can get them cheaper than that. But then you have your batteries. For me, I was lucky enough to get my batteries for free, which is really great. That helped tremendously um, cut the cost of the solar system. But for your solar charge controller, for a decent one, like an MPPT charge controller, you're looking at around at least $200 or so. Uh, Canadian anyway, it might be obviously cheaper in the US. Yeah, my one solar panel, the big one here, is a 330 watt solar panel at a dollar a watt, so 330 bucks or so, or sorry, the solar panel is 335 watts. But yeah, you're looking at $330 or so for that, and then 200 or so for the solar charge controller. So the price can add up. You include, you know, the cost of your batteries. If you're to buy multiple batteries, then that's obviously going to jack that price up too. Yeah, solar's not a must for everyone. I mean, if you have very low power needs, you could probably get away with running some type of portable power bank, like maybe a Jackery or what have you. However, if you don't have solar, how easy is it going to be for you to charge your Jackery unless you want to take it somewhere to have it charged up? or charge it up by your vehicle, which is still going to take gas in the end. Let's move on to number three and uh, we'll take it inside for that. Number three, yes, it is the wood stove. I might complain about this thing an awful lot, but to be honest with you, I really don't think that I could easily survive a winter here without it. It does create you know, kind of a dirty environment. I can't complain about it too, too much because it does make for a very cozy indoor environment. Um, in campers, as you know, the walls are pretty paper thin. Um, this definitely isn't a Four Caesar camper either. So the wood stove has definitely got me through multiple winters in this place. And for that, it definitely has to make this list. Number four on this list, we're headed to the washroom the tankless water heater. I get a ton of questions about this thing all the time. There seems to be a lot of different opinions on having one of these inside of your camper because, you know, they are specifically meant to be an outdoor unit and I am fully aware of that. I take the precautions that I feel I need to take in order to, you know, run one of these units safely inside. For example, I have a vent up here that's always open when I'm using the unit, a fan that I always run when I'm using the unit, and, you know, for the most part, leaving the door open at least a crack when I'm running the unit. I have also put carbon monoxide alarms in the bathroom when I've run the unit before. Those are just some things that I do to take precautions on running this inside. But to be 100% honest with you, I don't think that running this thing inside is any different than running your propane stove inside of your camper. But yeah, so the reason I actually decided to go with one of these units is actually because I ended up discovering that my onboard water heater uh, had a leak. It actually took me about two years to discover that. I had no idea because I had never owned a camper before, but my pump would go off probably once every five to ten minutes maybe and I thought that that was just normal I thought it was just a buildup of pressure and it would go off um, I actually discovered through an RV technician that came here that if my pump is going off every so often that means there's a leak somewhere I guess it would have been one fall um, I was actually winterizing the camper and I just happened to see that underneath the water heater which is pretty much under the bed in the bedroom um, I did happen to see that there was the, sorry, the plywood underneath of the water heater was wet. So obviously that tells me that there was a leak in the water heater, but that's probably the best thing that could have happened because this thing has been like an absolute game changer. So just some benefits of this thing is that you're no longer waiting 20 minutes for the water to heat up. It's, you know, it's hot water on demand, so it's hot water right away. And also, you use a hell of a lot less propane with one of these things. Anyway, if you're interested in learning more about this water heater, I actually have another video from when I just first installed this thing, so I will link that in the description below. And let's move on to number five. Okay, we're going to stay in this hot little bathroom for number five on this list, and that is the compost toilet. 
It's not for everyone, but when you live in one of these things full-time, off-grid, no power, these things are the most simple thing to deal with. And everybody's got to deal with their business when you live in one of these things. So we're not going to get too up close and personal um, with the compost toilet for your sake and mine. But yeah, they're really not as bad as you may think. And anyone who's used one will tell you that they're, they really are great. Um, there's no having to deal with dumping your black water, you know, having to deal with a black water tank. Yeah, just a real simple concept. You know, separate the urine from everything else and you should be good to go. Just a matter of having a pee jug, dumping it, and you know. Anyway, there's lots on the internet about composting toilets, so if you're interested in that, there are tons of other resources on YouTube. Just look up composting toilets or DIY composting toilets because to buy, you know, to buy composting toilets, they can be incredibly expensive, but you can literally make your own super cheap. So number six, the final thing on my list is water storage. If you live this way and you don't have a well or access to a well, something like this is going to make the world a difference. Obviously, this is my container that I don't have water in at the moment. Um, this goose up here is pretty upset about that because I think he's ready to go for a swim, but we'll get there. Yeah, my water containers are back here though. Obviously, this barrel here is to catch rainwater. And this barrel up here is, well, two barrels up here actually, are my gravity-fed barrels. Having water storage containers or some sort of water tower or what's the other thing called cistern that's the word I'm looking for but having yeah something to hold your water in is pretty important if you're gonna live off-grid without a well for me personally it's really easy and convenient um, to go pick up some water and transport it here and pump it into those storage containers but yeah, my particular system just makes it really easy to go ahead and put water into my fresh tank inside the camper. Yeah, I think that's it for this video though, guys. Hopefully that gave you some ideas about how you can make this lifestyle a little bit easier. Like I said, those are six things that make off-grid RV living easier for me. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the video or got something out of it, and I will catch you in the next one. By the way, in case anybody at all is wondering, Hilbert is still kicking around. Still walking around here like he owns the place. Yep. You tried, man. You tried.